the paper to introduce our speaker, uh, John Paul. And uh, John would introduce himself better than me. Okay, and he will start from introducing. Okay, can we have the lights down? All. Okay, I arrived in Israel in 1970, and I was the first geophysicist from Mahone Geologi, and I was a marine geophysicist on top of that, with the net result that I was sort of the weird guy there. And as a result, I kept my own library, which is now here at Haifa University, and my own map collection, which is now at the Hall Map Archive at Hekari Min Bahagami. And it was only uh, about uh, 15 years ago when Yossi Mart put me up for honorary membership of the Israel Geological Society that he mentioned that I had a background in the Arctic and so here I'll try to bring you up to speed uh, you can read what the title is there I was a graduate school uh, graduate in graduate school at Lamont uh, Geological Observatory and I had first worked for two and a half years at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution long before Spieb and Avraham came there. And uh, since I had spent about a year and a half at sea doing magnetics, gravity, seismic profiling, and uh, also the first computer programming at Woods Hole, when I arrived at Lamont, instead of putting me into the bathymetry or magnetics or gravity or seismic profiling department, they stuck me into the Arctic section. and. Uh, Back in those days, if you were a graduate student uh, going for the PhD, you had to spend one year at sea, which I think was an excellent thing, and that's what's missing from your education. But anyway, uh, so Lamont had been carrying out the U.S. Navy program on uh, Fletcher's Ice Island, or T3 as it was called, since 19, uh, uh, 1962. And uh, this is a view of uh, Fletcher's Ice Island, it came out of uh, a ice tongue uh, in northern Ellesmere Island. It produced a number, this ice tongue, the Elverton Ice Shelf, produced a number of ice stations. Uh, these were originally about 60 meters thick. They were freshwater ice, not sea ice. And uh, the amazing thing was that uh, in the early 50s, or actually late 40s, they discovered that these things had a completely different radar uh, cross-section on uh, the B-29s that were doing weather flights. And so they began tracking them, and in 1952, they made the first landing on it, and uh, this was occupied in total for over 7,000 days. Uh, the Air Force was operating it as long as they needed weather. Uh, as soon as they discovered intercontinental ballistic missiles, then the Navy took an interest because they had nuclear submarines. And so this was a wonderful place for civilian scientists to work, but uh, it was always the military who was funding uh, the costs of it. Uh, this was my uh, uh, PhD, basically what's inside the red uh, rectangle, although I did have to go back and work up all the navigation, some 7,000 celestial fixes. And it was only in 1967 that we began having uh, one of the six civilian uh, satellite navigation systems. Uh, in any case, the important thing was that within the red rectangle there, uh, I wrote my thesis. I had set up the first seismic profiler to be on the ice station. Profiler down below is 130 days long. Uh, and uh, the problem is the ice goes fairly slowly and does this kind of stuff. So in order to get a long profile, is quite difficult. In any case, by the 1980s, some 25% of the existing seismic in the Arctic were done with my machine. And the thing you see here is a one kilometer thick uh, blanket uh, all across the uh, Alpha uh, Mendeleev Ridge system. There are three ridges in the Arctic. There's the uh, extension of the mid-ocean ridge coming up from the Atlantic, uh, which is called the Gackle Ridge. Then there's the Lomonosov Ridge, which is broken off from the parent shelf. And then some 15% bigger than the Himalayas, but rising only a third as high as the Alpha Mendeleev Ridge. And this was my PhD thesis. 
One of the interesting things that was seen is uh, on the echo sounder, which was doing the sounding every second, uh, we would see these hyperbolic echoes. And on the seismic profiler underneath, uh, say 200, 300 meters down, all of a sudden everything was flat lined. And Bruce Hazen, who was sort of the master of uh, ocean bathymetry at that time, took one look at it and said, John, these are sediment waves. So my whole thesis was built around A, building a model for the ridge as if it were an extinct fossil uh, spreading ridge, an idea that Peter Vogt had also had based upon uh, uh, observations elsewhere. Oh, and the second thing being that these were sediment waves from a period of much higher current activity, in other words, more than 30 centimeters per second in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, this gives you an idea of the data over the ridge itself. Uh, is all the stuff that I took for the single channel system right in here. And of course, icebreakers did multi-channel uh, work elsewhere. They were never able to get in over the Alpha Ridge because this is where the multi-year ice, up to six, seven, eight years old, up to four, six meters thick. No icebreaker could get into that. The other parts of the Arctic, if the ice is less than two meters, icebreakers can go through. The other important thing was that after I left, the coring program on T3, which ultimately took about 700 cores, short cores, in the Arctic, uh, most of them were one, two million years. The uh, usual thought was that sediments were collecting from ice rafting uh, at the rate of about one meter per million years. And out of those four cores, one taken by the Canadians from a temporary station in 1983, and the other three taken by the USGS uh, for their heat flow program, uh, they varied between 45 million and 76 million years. And since we had no signs of active tectonics or earthquakes on the uh, Alpha Mendeleev Ridge, the question was, what was this causing? By that time, I had gotten off the ice, I had finished my PhD, I had come to Israel with my Israeli wife in 1970, and uh, had more or less given up writing on the Arctic. Uh, these are the four cores we're talking about. The track is uh, the track over that area, uh, over the uh, Alpha Ridge. Here you can see the Lomonoso Ridge, which was broken off from the Barnes Shelf when the Atlantic Ocean opened. Well, here again, why the Alpha Ridge? The uh, first, they were older than the one scientific drill hole that was made in 2004 on the Lomonoso Ridge. Uh, since the Caesar program of the Canadians in 1983, nobody had been up in that area. Uh, long afterwards, a fellow uh, who was analyzing all the cores from the Western Arctic noticed that there were mysterious iron, nickel, zinc spherules in all of the cores. On the other hand, uh, somebody working in paleontology in Europe had discovered that in the Eastern Arctic cores, uh, there were very fine nanofauna, which were found in the recent sediments, going back to the lower Jurassic. And the thought was somewhere there's erosion occurring in old Jurassic rocks, which are wafting these uh, nanofauna in. The other thing is that, uh, as I'll show, we discovered that over an area of about 200 by 600 kilometers, up to 500 meters of the upper sediments were missing. And uh, so go back in 2004, a classmate of mine, Ingve Christofferson from uh, Norway, invited me to bring the uh, uh, original seismic data to Bergen. We made uh, two sets of Xerox of all those records, uh, and he set about working on them. And two months later, he called me and said, please come back up to Bergen. And at the airport, he whispered to me, it's an asteroid impact area. And so we put out a uh, poster in the 2006 fall AGU meeting. Um, almost no response. We have, uh, we've been operating basically revealing everything we found and nobody's had any interest until the last couple of years when people uh, 
when we are dead and buried, want to get back up to the Alpha Ridge and do proper coring. The ice is thinning very rapidly, and probably next year, an icebreaker with a coring apparatus will get up in there. OK, so we decided, what can we do? If you can't break through the ice, submarines have been uh, very hesitant about going under the multi-gear ice because there's very little chance of their coming up if there's an emergency. So we decided, why not build a hovercraft to go over it? And so uh, 2007, we signed the contract for it. We began building the Sabvaba, not Sababa, but Sabvaba. Uh, if you look in Google, I've gotten up to 80 pages on that name. The other, only other place other than the hovercraft that we have is the uh, Eskimo language dictionary, where Sababa is a word that means flow swiftly over it. And it's the nearest thing we could find to an Eskimo word for hovering. OK, so the Sababa was built. In particular, for Arctic use, it has very heavy insulation on it. It has heaters in the engine compartment for keeping crucial things uh, uh, warm. And uh, here it arrived. And it has been used in a, what has happened here? It's been used in a number of programs. OK, getting close. Hi. <clears throat> Since 2008 up until 2014, uh, we have had it up to the ice many, many times. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the picture of it on the ice has been used in many, many uh, publications, which you'll see later. To get an idea of the tracks uh, over the years, uh, the orange tracks are all tracks up through 2012. OK, so continuing on, uh, here it was doing oceanographic uh, cruises in 2010. Uh, we had, for instance, a winch with a CTD. And from the cockpit, you could swing that out and immediately start running it down. All of these things were built by Ingve Christofferson in his workshop at home in Bergen. Uh, if you notice, just under the driver's uh, window, there is the symbol of the Mahone Geologi. I asked Benny Bagan for permission to do that. He said only on one condition, and that is that the five nations around the Arctic don't begin, don't begin arguing because Israel has a foothold there. <laughs> OK, uh, I was up on the Yermak Plateau a number of times. It was used by people from the Scott Institute for trying to measure the uh, wave heat in order to get an indication of what the average ice thickness would be. Uh, during this time, I, over five years, I spent the late summer months aboard the US icebreaker Healy, uh, while the United States and the University of New Hampshire were doing the extended continental shelf surveys. For me, it was a matter of trying to tell people who were doing modern work what it was like in the good old days in the ice station. Uh, and beyond that, just looking out across the ice and trying to figure out, OK, if we had the hovercraft up here, how would we get around? Uh, the important thing here is in Healy 1102, uh, which was the last one that I was on, uh, they made a big, long track together with the Canadian icebreaker Louis Saint Laurent, which had a USGS contingent on board doing seismics. And we were breaking ice for them, and then they were following us uh, so that the ice was broken up enough so that they would not lose either their air gun or their uh, screamer. And the interesting thing about uh, that was that uh, it crossed another area where uh, Polyak and others in 2005 had suddenly seen what they called uh, sediment waves. Uh, they had not known that I had published on 15,000 square kilometers of area that we'd crossed. Uh, with those things, but uh, this was the first time that they had ever been seen in the Arctic. In any case, aboard the Healy, all of a sudden, what the hell is that? This is the chirp all put together showing the whole uh, crossing uh, of the uh, Alpha Ridge. 
And the very interesting thing here is the multi-beam. We had a new multi-beam, a EM122 with uh, about uh, 400 uh, beams and going four kilometers on either side of the iceberg. And so this is eight kilometers wide and it is showing the side slopes. And in the side slopes, the red is up to 40 degrees. These are not parallel, these are not sediment waves. Uh, I compare this to what happens if you have a Doberman, uh, or no, a uh, Great Dane. Uh, he is very hungry, you feed him all his kiblets all at once, and too much water, and he throws up on the kitchen floor. You just have these blocks all over the place, and I believe this is definitely the ejective field. The interesting thing here is within the chirp, you have conformal exactly 25 meters, which is going over this. And I believe that this is the uh, mud, which settled out from a very muddy ocean uh, whenever this impact occurred. We believe the impact was probably several million years ago. As soon as there are longer cores, we should be able to get through this, see what's uh, going on, and then where do we get into this stuff? Not in the ejecta area, but the area where up to 500 kilometers is stripped off. Okay, we got an invitation to, uh, in 2011 to come up in 2014 with a uh, Polish Stern, the Polestar, the largest uh, icebreaker that the Germans have, the only one. Uh, which is run by the Alfred Wegener Institute in Bremerhaven. And so the whole idea was to be able to get out on the Alpha Ridge and uh, we began equipping ourselves for spending up to 500 days out there and hopefully drifting out uh, back down into the Atlantic. Uh, this was the cruise plan. Polar Stern would be operating closer to the Mendeleev Ridge. Uh, we would be in the Alpha Ridge itself. Uh, we went along with 100 core liners plus a hydrostatically boosted core, which Ingve had patented. The whole idea being, how can you do everything with a 3 8 inch Kevlar line with a braking strength of two tons operating from the ice and still have a core which could jam itself deep enough into the bottom. Okay, uh, in 2012, we had a program to go up and work uh, doing refraction together with the Swedish icebreaker Odin. We got 500 meters into the ice. A movie on this has been shown in Rishuta Shidor, the first channel, uh, once. It'll be shown twice more, and the name of that is North End of the Mist. The whole problem was we got 500 meters into the ice, or 500 kilometers up into the ice pack. When we were out of fuel, we then rendezvoused with the Odin, refilled our 2,500 liter tanks. And at that point, there was the worst storm in living Arctic history, which reduced visibility from 20 hours a day to two hours a day, so we couldn't navigate. Beyond that, it broke up the ice so that there were ice gravel, rubble, and pressure ridges all over the place. Net result is we couldn't really go uh, uh, over the next 500 kilometers to the uh, Lomonosov Fridge. So the decision was made instead for the graduate student who was going to spend a week or two uh, measuring earthquakes on the Gackel Ridge to instead spend over a month. And during that time, in an ACES seismic area of the Gackel Ridge, with the hydrophone array that he put out, uh, he was able to detect 300 earthquakes. So the whole ridge apparently is seismic. Uh, the interesting thing here <coughs> was that an array of five hydrophones were put around and up to five kilometers between them. And then a Wi-Fi was set up so the Wi-Fi, the center of the Wi-Fi was the hovercraft. And the hovercraft was able to receive in real time everything coming from the hydrophone. <coughs> Excuse me. This photo was chosen as one of the 10 best science pictures uh, by the Science Magazine in 2014. If you do have water, I suspect I'm going to need it. OK, September 2013, we were a satellite station for acoustic and oceanographic work that was done by Woods Hole 
Scripps Institute, National Science, uh, the uh, Office of Naval Research, and also the Norwegian, and also a collection of all the buoys that they put up in the North Pole when the Russians set up their touristic station in March. And they implant the buoys, and then the whole idea is to collect the buoys when they come out into the French Strait. So we were doing that. Now, this is the assortment of the equipment that was made. The red things here are those uh, acoustically, hydrostatically boosted cores. The whole idea there <coughs> is you lower that with a six meter core pipe. When it gets down to the bottom, it opens up the umbrella up top. And then, disconnected from the core, it pulls out a pin which is holding a piston. Now, with hydrostatic pressure at 2,000 meters, we have 200 bars on that. And when the pin is pulled out, down it goes. The effect is basically 13 tons of lead sitting on that core pipe. If we go to 4,000 meters, it would be 26 tons. One core was taken, and after that, we were in too deep water because we were not over the Alpha Ridge. We wound up being only over the Lomonosov Ridge. Okay, so continuing on. Some of the other things. These are all kinds of things for augering, using a battery, cables going up, and then a starter engine off an automobile, together with a chainsaw thing that you auger a hole, you put that down, and then you can run a chainsaw down to the bottom of the ice and finish that way. Bless you. I should say unaccustomed as I am to talking all the time. Anyway, the thing at the end was the sled for putting a GoPro in inside a four kilometer uh, depth uh, uh, housing and various other pieces of equipment which were built here. Uh, here are our two intrepid uh, guys, Ingve Christofferson, two years younger than I. At this time, he was 73 years old. And then, uh, <coughs> Adon Tholfsen, he spent a year drifting with the French on the sailboat that they drifted across the Arctic in. Uh, he also has gone up to the North Pole and come back in a kayak. And he is a logistic guy for the BBC in Spitzberg. So on the 4th of August uh, in 2014, uh, <coughs> we went up to Tromso with an hovercraft and 20 tons of supplies were put on the Polish stern. You can see that the hovercraft has now been stuck uh, just forward of the bridge on the uh, Polish stern. The whole idea there was, okay, get up where the cores were on the Alpha Ridge. Here's the initial uh, polar stern track. And then after that, it just started budding into the Lomonosov Ridge, continued all the way up beyond the Asex hole, and then finally called it quits and said, okay, you're not gonna get the Alpha Ridge this year. Uh, there's the continuation of the track on the upper right-hand side. There were two other uh, icebreakers that tried to get up in the same area, and they were rebuffed because of the ice conditions and the uh, lack of visibility. Uh, here is the obligatory group photo that uh, the scientists always have when you pull up to the North Pole. And uh, uh, Ingve is shown there in yellow uh, uh, Swedish jacket, and then Alden is uh, sitting down below in the black. And uh, after some, uh, what, three weeks on board the Polar Stern, they finally found a place at 8720, 153 East that uh, the ice was thick enough so that they could be put down. And the helicopter was used for offloading stuff. Here are some of our uh, fuel bladders, each one is 1,000 liters of diesel fuel. Uh, here was the hovercraft itself being lowered. It has 100 of these skirt fingers that are this size that make contact with the ground. The hovercraft 
weighs five tons, it's 40 feet long, it's just the length that you don't need a master's certificate in order to uh, be able to drive it. Its maximum speed on water is 85 kilometers per hour, 40 points, 43 knots. And uh, its official uh, payload is 2,200 kilos. <coughs> We've been carrying up to 3,000. In more pictures of this, the helicopter flying around, all the scientists out helping uh, with the downloading, uh, sling crews coming. And uh, finally, the first slide you saw is when they waved goodbye to the polar stair and they were left all alone on the ice. Uh, they, they had, uh, I think, 13 tons, uh, 21 tons of supplies were uh, left for them there. Okay, the plan was as follows. The hovercraft would be the mother vehicle. It would be able, under good conditions, to go up to 100 kilometers away from its base. We have all kinds of markers uh, with GPS that can be left so that they know where to return to. Uh, for the uh, geophysical program, the whole thing would be uh, for running an air gun and a single hydrophone. Uh, we also had a four element chirp uh, for um, doing uh, sub-bottom profiling. We had a uh, 12 kilocycle echo sounder together with a 30 kilocycle and 200 kilocycle. Uh, there was an acoustic Doppler uh, current meter that we brought along. Sonar boys were taken but were never used. Uh, there were two uh, recording uh, uh, current meters uh, which were strung down at 800 and 2,000 meters, uh, as well as a thermistor strain that was uh, put down, a weather station, and then mass uh, balance things who were uh, measuring the amount of radiation coming in. I should point out, point out that uh, certainly from the Western countries, uh, it has been almost 50 years since uh, a wintering over occurred uh, on the Arctic. Uh, there was an icebreak that was put in the Chukchi Sea back in 2000, uh, uh, 1998, I believe. And uh, they were doing only oceanography. Uh, geology, we have the three cores. We had 100 uh, uh, liners. Uh, we have uh, the GoPro on the bottom camera. And uh, for glaciology, of course, measuring ice thickness by, uh, within a minute, being able to drill a hole through a meter of ice. Uh, so anyway, spoiler alert, okay, beginning in September, entering in June, this is the continuum of, uh, of observations that are made. Down at the bottom for the camp, we have two periods of ice dynamics where the camp was subducted or turned into a pressure ridge. And the nice thing about the hovercraft is that basically you can move. Other ice stations have had to manhaul their cabins. Uh, Station Alpha, for instance, finally wound up in, in eight separate pieces of ice. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, the important thing, the most important thing from my mind certainly was the uh, seismic. This was 1,000 kilometers total. And if you look at the top part, instead of flushing out directly into the continuation of the North Atlantic, the weather systems which were causing havoc with the uh, change in uh, weather over the United States, with the pol polar gyre, <coughs> caused us to cross the uh, Lomonosov Ridge five times. And three of those crossings were in places that nobody's ever been. And certainly the lower part over the Morris Chess Surprise, uh, an atomic breaker tried to get in there together with the uh, Swedish icebreaker five years ago and uh, finally had to go back to Murmansk for repairs. It just couldn't get in. <coughs> okay, here I plotted the track over the uh, DTM of the uh, Arctic. And you can see the daily fixes, which would come in on emails, and uh, plotting basically what they did over the Lomonosov Ridge. 
okay, here's the weather uh, system being put up. Uh, all of these things within a few hours could be installed. Uh, he's got a battery behind his uh, legs. You plug that in and uh, in less than one minute, you can uh, bore a three inch hole through the ice. Here is this thing, which uh, uh, basically you set it up and you go down and uh, if you've already bored a hole, then the thing which is holding the chain goes down through the hole. And so if you make four holes, then you can cut, 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 and then you have a hydro hole. Uh, there's a rectangular hole here that's been cut, and this just fits the current meter. It goes through, and each one of these holes, what they did is, in Spitsbergen, for the snowstorms, they put a red rod, which is hollow, for the snow plows to know where the road is. They stole a whole bunch of those. And the whole idea was to put the rope through that, and then thereafter, if you wanted to raise or lower it, of course, Five crossings of the uh, of the Lomonosa Fridge, the current meters that they had at 2,800 meters had to be lifted up at least a kilometer. Net result was if you poured boiling water into that red tube, you could very quickly melt the ice that was holding the uh, cable and then start pulling up or pulling down. There are all kinds of things that they have developed over the years for making life Pretty simple for two people. Okay, here's the current meter going down. There's the beginning of the hydro hole. Uh, the interesting thing is the yellow thing, which is uh, on the side of the hovercraft, is the drum, which is holding two kilometers of uh, three eighths inch uh, uh, Kevlar. $17,000. Uh, here is the uh, acoustic Doppler current profiler going down. A bigger hole had to be made. Uh, another hole being augured for the uh, thermistor chain. Uh, now, a uh, number of years ago, I started uh, pushing for autonomous echo sounding buoys. Uh, around Antarctica, in the Arctic, and especially in the Eastern Pacific, uh, there's very little data, especially in the oceans, to tie in with the uh, uh, satellite altimetry. And of course, if you have any kind of bathymetry in those areas, then you can uh, quantify the gravitational signal you're getting with the amount of sediment. Uh, which could possibly be there and come up with a better uh, calculation for what the synthetic bathymetry would be. Net result was that a half a million dollars was spent of NSM, NSF funds and got nowhere. I then took over the project and uh, $130,000 were spent building something that uh, worked briefly, which was developed in Bergen, uh, Norway. Finally, when I was on the cruise with the Norwegian icebreaker, uh, a fellow from Woods Hole said, I'm ready to build you buoys. And so rather than the idea of ping, 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 where's the bottom, the whole idea was to use a 10 kilocycle uh, uh, sounder and try to get the bottom on the first ping. <clears throat> Five of these buoys were built. Uh, they were put out at distances of five kilometers from the hovercraft. Uh, these, for instance, are some of the buoys and some of the tracks we made. Uh, ultimately, this was a failure. Only two of the five were recorded. The other three were probably part of a pressure ridge. Beyond that, uh, as time went by, the batteries would die, and uh, uh, we were in a situation where the results just plain did not match uh, what we expected for the Arctic. There is a grid for the Arctic of 500 meters based upon all the ice landings and everything else. Uh, it needs to be corrected, but not by that much. So anyway, I finally decided after spending $90,000 in this, I'm out of that business. But for the kinds that would operate in the tropics uh, in the uh, Pacific Ocean, through sunlight and uh, 
not having batteries which are being kept at 30 degrees below zero, you should be able to do uh, excellent work, and especially drifting around Antarctic. So anyway, that was that part of the program. We brought along JP6 uh, uh, cold weather uh, jet fuel. Uh, we had assumed that uh, Auden would be taken out around the 1st of March uh, with an airplane. And uh, airplanes coming out to land on the ice usually have to carry the fuel to get back. So we had uh, 10 of these drums, uh, hopefully to refuel that aircraft. Ultimately, this was all used for heating. On top of the core liners, and then on top of that are the Go GoPro uh, program. There was the GoPro sled, and uh, this was used to great advantage to see that uh, fish that are seen six to eight degrees further south actually exist up near the North Pole. Beyond that, we had, uh, I'll show you later, uh, all kinds of pictures of what's going on, and of course, as with the Nautilus uh, films, you'll always have coming through the light these copepods that are sipping back and forth. Uh, okay, the whole idea was to build themselves a hangar, and they had taken uh, two plywood boards with spacers that uh, kept them about 30 or 35 centimeters apart. The whole idea was to go to the melt pools that form during the summer, and which begin freezing on the top with a chainsaw cutting them out to make basically your cement blocky but made out of ice. You put the two of them on either side, building up that way, put snow in, and then go and take water out of the uh, melt hole, put it in there, and at 25 degrees below zero, pretty soon you have a ice wall. This was the 110 uh, square meter hangar that they built. Now, the problem was, the whole plan was to try to pee on a piece, piece of ice that was two meters thick. The more you load on a piece of ice that's one meter and ten thick, the more it does this. So between, uh, I think the estimate was uh, something on the order of 30 tons between the building itself and the hovercraft inside and, and the equipment they had here. So this boat down began to produce small cracks. In the meantime, there was when they wild snowstorm, and the snowstorm left drifts that were up to two meters thick. The estimate was that 250 tons of snow had landed also, uh, and they, A, they had to go and dig out all the stuff that was under the snow, trying to remember where it was. Luckily, this was before the sun had gone below the horizon, and they were in five months of darkness. <clears throat> but the net result was finally there was up to 50 centimeters of water over the uh, hydro hole. Uh, they're wearing survival suits, so they're perfectly good and warm and everything up to uh, their heads. But uh, it was quite necessary at that point to move the hovercraft out from the ice hangar and to disconnect all the equipment and everything else and start living with the hovercraft with ice insulation over it and a great big tarp to protect it from the snow. Um, this is sort of camp life. I, I am pretty sure that this was the beginning of the year, not uh, the next spring. In any case, on <coughs> the year that I spent on T3, I got very good at making haircuts. And of course, the, at the beginning, the hair, haircuts that were awful, uh, nobody really cared. Uh, cooking, we had food for, they had food for 500 days for two people. GoPros were put all over the place and uh, we now have up to 100 hours of video which a full length feature movie will be made from. This is including interviews with a whole pile of people that were done after uh, asking their opinions of what they thought and uh, their comments. So stay tuned. Uh, inside, it's warm and cozy. Uh, this thing is rather small. On the other hand, when it was used as a water taxi on the Thames by a company for quite a while that would go through London at uh, 60 miles an hour on the Thames, uh, they would carry 18 people inside. So they're seating for 18. 
We have bunks. There's the owner's cabin in the back that's one meter deep. And then one side, which is all laptops. Here again are the laptops, seismic, echo sounder, email. We do have an antenna on the roof, which is specifically for working with the Iridium system and emails and uh, all kinds of material that were sent back and forth during the whole time of the drift. Here's a screenshot from the seismic data acquisition system. And uh, you can see the kind of penetration they're getting. I'm comparing this with a multi-channel streamer that was done by the Polarstern up uh, probably within 300 kilometers of them. We have the same thing down here, which is recorded digitally. And uh, it's probably a little bit better than uh, uh, the, the multi-channel is probably a little bit better. And you can certainly get velocities from that. But it certainly is not bad. These are uh, various things that he sent back of uh, things that they were seeing, uh, deformation. And we may very well finally have an answer to whether or not the uh, Amerasia Basin opened like a windshield wiper around northern Alaska. And uh, with the number of crossings that we have on that side of the Lomonoso Fridge, uh, that may come out from the analysis. The air bottles that you see up there, uh, we would pump them up to 190 bars. They would give us 22 shots with the air gun. The air gun would go off every time that the uh, hovercraft had moved 25 meters. Uh, all told, with 1,000 kilometers, there were 40,000 shots. This they felt right under the hovercraft. Uh, the air immediately 